15, and I will call the committee the whole to order. Um, call the roll. Alderperson Ackley. Here. Alderperson Donahue. Here. Alderperson Feldy. Here. Alderperson Flicky Penensky. Here. Alderperson Decker. Here. Alderperson Cefalio. Present. Alderperson Mitchell. Here. Alderperson Boren. Here. And Alderperson Sorensen is here. All right. Would you please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? Pledge of Allegiance and to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Anyone from public forum today? Seeing none. Is there approval of the minutes from our October 19th meeting? Motion to approve. Motion to approve. Oh. Second. There's been a motion by Mary Lynn, second by Marcus. Oh. Any, any further discussion? <laughs> Seeing none, all those in favor, please state aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Aye. Ch chair votes aye. The minutes are approved. All right. So today we have Joe Trubrod, who will be given an update on the water utility um, project that they got coming down. So Joe, thanks so much for tuning in. Um, oh, I missed Rose for the roll call. She sent me a message. Rose is, is here. So sorry about that, Rose. Um, Joe, take it away. Okay. Well, thank you, Alderman Sorensen and Mr. Mayor and council members. I appreciate the opportunity to present uh, this to you tonight. Um, one of the challenges of a remote presentation is tough to read the audience. Uh, but if I hear anybody shout uh, stop or please stop, I'll take that as a sign to speed things up and uh, I'll do my best to keep this moving. Um, following on, on Administrator Wolf's uh, State of the City, I'm, I'm very happy and excited to present the project, which is uh, very much about the replacement of critical infrastructure, in this case, uh, what we're referring to as the raw water improvements project at the water utility. Uh, for those of you who haven't met me or I haven't been able to meet you, I have uh, been at the utility since 1996. I started in the engineering department there and uh, became a superintendent in 1998, and I've been there ever since. Not quite as long as the photo here from 1935 of the utility at that point in time, but for quite quite a long period of time. Um, I'll go ahead and get started. So let me just, uh, for the benefit of uh, <clears throat> the public and, and everyone, give a, a little background. What is the Sheboygan Water Utility? Uh, we are a public utility uh, under the state of Wisconsin and we provide drinking water to the community. And we've been a public utility since 1909, <clears throat> located at 72 Park Avenue. And in fact, water production uh, predates 1909 uh, and goes all the way back to 1887 when a small company came and built a small intake pipeline and a pumping station and installed uh, some wooden water main and served water for profit to the city of Sheboygan. Um, <clears throat> as a public utility, we're regulated by the Wisconsin Public Service Commission, uh, same regulator of, of private utilities like Alliance and, and WPR and such. We're also regulated by the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources and the US EPA. The latter two have a lot more to do with the water quality aspects of what we do and the Public Service Commission has a lot to do with the financial aspects of what we do, for example, rate setting uh, and things like that. Um, one really important thing to keep in mind about the water utility, many of you know this, others might not, but we uh, operate entirely on water revenues, so we don't receive any ta tax monies or anything from the city general fund. Water utility operates entirely on water fees, water revenues. Um, it's important to remember, and we'll talk a little more later about a water bill, 
which is produced by the WADI facility. Uh, that bill also includes the uh, sanitary sewer charges and garbage and re recycling charges. And those we turn over to the uh, proper entities for those uh, revenues uh, and we simply retain the water revenue portion for our operations. Um, as many of you know, the utility is, is uh, governed by a Sheboygan Water uh, Board, Board of Water Commissioners elected by the Common Council, uh, where the community is uh, uh, served by a number of very good commissioners, and I'd be remiss in not mentioning our longstanding commissioner, and I like to tease him that he was first appointed to the board before I graduated from high school. <laughs> and take a look at me. I graduated from high school a long time time ago. So the community is very uh, uh, fortunate to have uh, Jerry Vandercreek serve for decades as the Board of Water Commissioners, along with uh, other very fine uh, serving members. Um, customers of the water utility include all city residents. Uh, we also serve the city of Sheboygan Falls and the village of Kohler, their wholesale water customers. So we have nothing to do with their water distribution, but we do sell them water on a wholesale basis. Uh, so all the water in those communities is coming from the Sheboygan Water Utility. Um, just a, a little basic background in, in providing drinking water. There's, there's four basic steps. <clears throat> we have to have a source of, of raw, uh, we refer to it as raw or untreated water. And in the case of Sheboygan, we're very lucky to have Lake Michigan on our doorsteps. It's a, a very fine source of uh, water, uh, actually probably better now than decades ago uh, due to a number of uh, agricultural runoff and industrial runoff control. The source of drinking water for the, the city uh, is, is a very, very good one. Um, you need a process to pump the raw water through a, a water treatment uh, process or plant to make it safe and potable. And that plant, is, as you see here uh, in a drone shot, uh, is located at 72 Park Avenue. And the shot does give a, a good impression that water treatment plants tend to grow over time. They're, they're never just plunked down in one spot and, and, and uh, all together finished. They tend to uh, grow over time and spread over what land they have available, and you can get a, an impression of that from the, the photo here. Um, the third aspect, uh, you, when you finish treating the water, you need a separate means or station to pump the water through a water distribution network to the citizens, and that consists of, in our case, 207-ish miles of water main, water towers, pressure booster stations, valves, hydrants, all those things that we need to serve water to, to the customers. Um, the fourth and, and also important aspect, you need to have an accurate metering or measuring system of the customer's usage so that you can bill and provide uh, appropriate customer service. Um, and in the city of Sheboygan, we have uh, just over 19,000 customer accounts uh, in order to do that. Um, the photo here is also helpful. It does, was taken in 2020 and it shows you that uh, we don't have a lot of available space around the water treatment plant at 72 Park Avenue. <clears throat> so the raw water uh, improvement project has, has a lot to do with raw water, untreated water from the lake and how we acquire that. And currently the Sheboygan Water Utility uses two raw water pipelines that go out into Lake Michigan. Our veteran is a 30 inch cast iron pipeline that was installed in 1909 uh, at a length of uh, 5,100 feet and, and depth that you can see there. Uh, our baby was installed in 1959 at the 36 inch uh, concrete pipeline a uh, much shorter length, only 2,100 feet out and in less uh, depth of water. Uh, and those two pipelines provide all the drinking water for the communities that I mentioned. The 30 inch can produce 11 million gallons of water a day, 11 MGD as we would say. And the 36 inch can produce more, about a little more than twice as much, 24 million gallons a day. 
Um, <clears throat> pipelines in Lake Michigan are, are pretty common. Uh, most uh, communities of any size along the Great Lakes use it as a water source. So from a civil engineering uh, perspective, these pipelines tend to have a normal working lifetime of about 100 years, more or less. Um, so right away, you key in on that 1909 uh, intake, which has uh, exceeded 100 years of lifetime, certainly. Um, the last point, uh, showing a water utility on an average day uh, produces about 12 million gallons of water for those customers. In the summer, that might go up to 18, 19 million gallons a day. New Year's Day tends to be our lowest water consumption day. It might be six or five MGD, but on average, it's about 12. And I would just note above that, that older intake uh, cannot produce 12 million gallons of water a day. Uh, the newer one can, um, and those are the two that we're operating on. So uh, raw water pipelines deliver water from the lake uh, into an underground structure known as a shore well. Um, it's basically a circular or rectangular um, reservoir in the ground. Uh, lake water enters that reservoir. Um, in our case, the shore well uh, dates to its original excavation down to bedrock in 1887. So in 1887, when that company came and formed a private utility, they dug a well down to bedrock, and it, it is what has developed into the current shore well. Now, changes have been made over the, the years, including structural evaluations and some rehab. But the core structure does date to that original excavation. Um, although serviceable, the shore well has also exceeded its normal working lifetime of 100 years, uh, certainly well exceeded that. Um, <clears throat> so what are the problems? Uh, you know, why am I here talking to you? Uh, over the past, some of you, some of the public might have uh, had awareness of our project uh, and some might not, but the problems are we've got a 30 inch intake and a shore well that have exceeded their normal working lifetimes. Um, the 36 inch intake, the, the newer one, if it were to fail, which can happen, the 30 inch cannot meet average daily demand for the community. It's very close, but it, it really would not uh, produce 12 MGD in a reliable fashion. Uh, both of those intake pipelines are subject to winter ice formation. This phenomenon has become more common in Lake Michigan, especially in uh, intake pipelines that are not very deep, like that 36 inch pipeline. Uh, and most utilities, uh, depending on the year, have, experience and, and try to uh, manage wintertime icing. That 36 inch intake is a substandard distance offshore. Most uh, modern intakes now are, are at least a mile off the shoreline. That one again was installed in 1959 and for whatever reason they went 2100 feet and, and, and they stopped. Uh, the myth is that they ran out of money. I, I don't know what happened, but they only went 20, 100 feet at that point in time. One other factor uh, of the utility is subject to inspection from, from and by the WDNR, and they have noted that our low lift pumps, those are the pumps that take raw water and send it through the plant, are at or below now the high lake levels that we're seeing. So there's a potential for flooding. The DNR has noted that as, as an issue of some concern. One very big factor is uh, we have no neighboring water utilities that are large enough to back us up. You know, some communities like Manitowoc and Two Rivers uh, each have a public water utility and, and actually have an interconnection and are large enough to supply each other in a significant way if one utility had a major failure. We don't have a neighbor like that. The town of Sheboygan does have a municipal uh, water system, but it's not large enough to 
supply of water for the city uh, along with our uh, wholesale customers. So we're a lone water utility in, in that sense. We have no means of backup. Um, so what should we do about these problems? Uh, in 2016, the utility completed a feasibility study and we focused on a new intake pipeline. Uh, the study was done by a consulting firm out of Chicago uh, and ultimately on, on much review, they recommended the installation of a new 54 inch pipeline. Uh, study also recommended the construction of a new shore well. You know, those two uh, pieces of infrastructure are, are intimately related. Uh, to connect a new pipeline to an old shore well uh, would not make sense for a, a lot of reasons. Uh, the new shore well as well would include a new low lift pumping station, again, to send that raw water through the water treatment plant. And finally, uh, out of the feasibility study, there was a recommendation that these would be designed for a 100-year lifetime, and that's perfectly feasible. You know, often in today's society, we have a lot of throwaway uh, consumer goods, so the, even the concept of a 100-year lifetime is, is a little bit foreign, but in the water industry, it, it is, is not and is achievable, as we've seen from in infrastructure that we currently operate. Um, early on, this, this project has really been formative for many, many years. Uh, and in uh, 04, the utility had approached city and requested uh, a small easement for the construction of the future intake pipeline and facility. And you'll see here an overhead shot of the water utility adjacent to Volrath Park. Uh, you'll see again that the water utility building pretty much occupied the entire parcel of, of land. There's some very steep shoreland to the south. Uh, but the area that we requested an easement uh, for was north, shown by the hatched uh, rectangle, about 60 feet by 120 feet. Um, and the city at that time did not want to sell property to the water utility, uh, but they did agree uh, to uh, provide an easement for construction and operation of a future intake facility. Um, so that's where we would like to locate this this new facility. And obviously it's close to the current plant, which is a benefit and, and economical. Uh, it's also important to note that the facility, uh, the raw water facility, could also supply raw water to a different water treatment plant in the future. Um, where that may be, we don't exactly know. How far in the future, we don't exactly know. The current water treatment plant itself has good lifetime left in it. But what we would be building here is actually a piece of a future water plant, you know, some decades down, down the road. Uh, that area of Valrath Park, if, if you're not familiar, familiar, is kind of a flat hill area right by the shore. It's not visible from the roadway at all. Uh, it does have one uh, disc uh, golf uh, hole uh, along it. Uh, but it's, it's a low area there just north of, of the water treatment plant. Um, the new 54 inch intake pipeline, uh, we would like to run it out about 6,000 feet and, and that would have a capacity of about 36 million gallons of water a day. You can see here a little bit of a image of uh, where that uh, pipe would go out. One reason you wanna go a significant length offshore is to get away from runoff from the Pigeon River, the Sheboygan River. Uh, 6,000 feet is, is a, a good distance out. You also wanna be in deeper water that helps reduce icing potential. Just gives you a little better source of water. Um, unfortunately, the Lake Michigan uh, uh, bottom uh, slope is very gradual, but you have to go a long ways out to gain much depth. Um, but at this length, we'd be in about 50 some feet of water, which is a very uh, contemporary standard for Lake Michigan intakes. 
the building itself is, is very modest. It'd, it'd be about a 50 foot by 80 foot masonry building. And here you see a, a schematic of it. Um, it takes architectural features from kind of the core of the water treatment plant itself, which was built in 1929. Nice lintels above the doorway, nice brick features. Um, otherwise, pretty, pretty simple, uh, but resembling the uh, design of, of the water treatment plant itself. Uh, the drawing might be a little hard to see, but within the building, we would have that shore well. Again, that's basically, a, in this case, a rectangular structure, <clears throat> almost like a basement very deep into the ground where the raw water enters. We have pumps located in that shore well. We have the electrical equipment for those pumps, uh, backup generators if we were to lose electricity, and a, a small chemical feed room for some pretreatment of, of the water if we were to have taste and odor issues. Uh, often we want to get that treatment started right when the water comes in the door, so to speak. A very small building, not, not occupied on a daily basis, monitored remotely, but uh, very near to the water treatment plant, which does have an operator on duty monitoring operations on the clock. Um, one, one story building, uh, pretty simple overall. Um, of course, cost is, is a factor in infrastructure replacement. What, what will this cost? How do we pay for it? Um, the current uh, estimate of construction cost is $35 million uh, for this 100-year lifetime piece of infrastructure. Uh, that's an estimate. We're just beginning a detailed design phase, so that, that's subject to some change. Uh, but that figure has evolved as, as we've gotten more and more detailed and further in the process. Um, that's a lot of money. That would be the largest uh, infrastructure replacement project for the utility, certainly in the last 60 years, if not 80 years, a uh, very large, huge piece of infrastructure replacement. Um, uh, the utility has been working with uh, Wisconsin public uh, finance professional, professionals and Carol Worth on funding options. We have a longstanding relationship with Carol and it has helped us to fund numerous projects in, in the past. We have some options. The uh, state of Wisconsin provides uh, what are, what's known as safe drinking water loans. On a project like this, they would offer a 30-year loan um, those have certain benefits, low interest rates, uh, they have some downsides, they're not callable, uh, and a few other issues. Uh, the private water revenue bond market is also available, and in that, that market we could seek funding of 30 or even 40 year terms. You know, again, 40 years is a long time if you're building a very short-lived project, for, for a 100 year project, 40 years of funding is is not entirely unreasonable to consider. Uh, water re revenue bonds are basically loans against the future revenues of the water utility. And again, uh, we've uh, used that tool in the past on various projects. And uh, we do have possible FEMA BRIC uh, grant projects. Uh, Mayor Vandersteen's been helping us uh, review some of those. We, we feel we might have a, a small portion of the project that might qualify for a, a BRIC grant here, and, and we're in the process of applying for that, uh, for about $2.6 million of that cost. Um, <clears throat> one of the important things uh, to know is that the funding plan would not have an impact on, on property taxes or the city budget. Uh, all Sheboygan Water Utility debt is paid out of those water revenues uh, again. So this borrowing would not impact uh, anyone's property taxes or the city budget. Uh, the new annual debt service, again, depending on what the actual costs would be, but roughly they'd be about $1.6 to $2 million per year uh, in debt service. And uh, you know, public utilities are, are not allowed to have uh, a 
return on revenue that's exceeding kind of a minimum standard of, for the state of two to three percent. Uh, so certainly to uh, generate an additional 1.6 or $2 million a year is going to take ongoing rate cases for uh, water rates. Uh, to cover that debt service, we would need about 22% uh, revenue increase uh, over current revenues that we're seeing at the utility, which are about $9 million a year. Um, one, the well-established uh, 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 policy of, of, the, of, of the Board of Water Commission, Commissioners is a commitment to spreading rate increases over time as much as possible. Uh, so that would be the intent here as well. And, and we've already begun planning in, in that light. Uh, we would not uh, propose or envision a 22% increase in one year, but a phased in uh, approach to manage water rate increases in, in the future. Um, it's important to look at where are we currently with water rates. Uh, we're currently very low, as you can see from the, the bar chart, we're basically at the bottom of water rates uh, in terms of cost. Uh, for a quarterly water bill, 18,750 gallons, you'll see the, the charge here. And again, when you, you see a bill from the water utility, it's more than this because of the additional charges, but just the water portion is what we're comparing here. And you can see for Sheboygan, you know, it's about 53, $54 uh, upwards to some of our fellows where it's three times that amount <clears throat> in, in other communities. Uh, so we are very low right now. Uh, in order to pay for this project, uh, we're not going to be able to stay at the very uh, low end of, of water rates in the state, but you can see we have a lot of room before we're starting to get uh, even to some of uh, communities like Green Bay and Racine, Wausau, um, kind of in the middle to higher range uh, shown here. Um, you know, so we've, we've seen the need to replace critical infrastructure, you know, clearly to provide drinking water to the community is, is extremely important. Our assets are aging, they need, they need replacement. How do we know it's good investment? Um, one of the projects that the utility, uh, in conjunction with the Public Service Commission, uh, completed was a 50-year water demand study looking at future customers, growth, uh, countywide, uh, and using a lot of uh, information and different factors. And all of that went into uh, right-sizing the design at that 36 million gallon per day level. So we didn't pick that out of thin, thin air. We actually did a very detailed uh, look at where we expect growth to occur where it might occur, you know, might we serve other wholesale customers, city of Plymouth, Oostburg, these kind of communities in the future uh, to come up with that, that uh, figure as a design of 36 million gallons a day. Of course, in general, if you uh, have a higher capacity intake pipeline, it's going to cost more dollars. So we don't want more than we reasonably need we want to right size it in, in a way that uh, has some basis. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that, that's very important for public utilities uh, and, and understanding of them is that, you know, we, we alone don't get to just decide we're going to build this project. Uh, it actually has to be authorized by the Public Service Commission uh, we would have to submit the project for construction authorization because of its size. And one of their key processes is to uh, eliminate or minimize stranded assets that the public has paid for. So the PSC is not going to authorize a project that ends up or is likely to result in stranded assets. Uh, they are uh, uh, objective oversight on, on a local public utilities expenditures and 
and they will uh, cut projects. It, it's not a rubber stamp by any means. Um, so they provide a, a very good oversight of spending uh, at the state level. Um, as I mentioned before, we're the only large water provider in the county. Uh, you know, again, we don't have anyone else we can tap into. Uh, and in fact, to meet some of that 50 year growth, if and when it were to occur, uh, we have to be positioned and, and have the infrastructure to do that. Um, one of the things the utility has always been committed to is, is trying to keep dollars local. We take dollars out of the local economy. We try to keep them in the local economy. And our projects do often result in, in local contractors having work, local engineering firms having work, such as Donahue, who's uh, one of the uh, engineer consultants on this project, um, and an effort to, to do that as much as possible. And, and then finally, you know, as you've seen, we've got infrastructure dating to 1887 to 1909. As we delay, uh, costs are only going to increase, and, and the risk of a catastrophic, catastrophic failure goes up as, as these uh, pieces of infrastructure age as well. Uh, they've been very well managed and, and inspected every year, but clock is ticking and the, and the time is here to replace them and, and we know that and to delay would only escalate costs more and more year by year. Um, so just kind of rounding out, um, you know, where, where do we go from here? Uh, currently, the final design phase of the project is, is underway and scheduled for completion in, in June of 2021. Uh, preliminary design has been out. Uh, we've, we've reviewed that with a number of parties, DNR, Public Service Commission, um, our, our colleagues at uh, DPW and planning, uh, a number of entities that, that have uh, seen the preliminary design and given us some feedback, uh, as well as our own staff. Um, I would be remiss in not mentioning, you know, I have the honor of presenting this, but of course th this is uh, the fruit of, of uh, labor of many people at the Wadi utility and from a technical basis in particular, uh, Bill Swearingen and Andy Wellman, Josh Kubo and Dan Marzacek have been very instrumental in the technical review of this project to date. Um, and as we enter final design, uh, we'll be fleshing out those details. Uh, in the spring of 2021, we'll have enough to submit to the Public Service Commission for construction authorization and begin that review process, which is about a six to nine month process. Um, We've already met with them a number of times to, to get their feedback and to be sure they understand the project, the need for the project uh, as well. Uh, we would like to go out to bid in late 2021 uh, and hopefully enter a, a positive bidding environment. You know, this project involves the construction, installation of pipeline in, in the bed of Lake Michigan there aren't a, a lot of contractors that do that work, but there are, there are some, and we would hope to get good competitive bidding if we have a well-designed project. Um, construction would take at least two seasons, uh, given the length of the pipeline. Uh, we have a possibility of perhaps a second emergency shorter pipeline, if that is affordable or not, to consider as well. Um, with those bid results, then, we would seek uh, the Board of Water Commissioners and Council approval of the funding package. So at that point in time, we would have more details about the funding package um, and, and the best options to minimize uh, the cost uh, going forward, you know, understanding that this is a very costly project and, and it, it certainly is, is not going to be inexpensive regardless of uh, however much we, we tweak it. Um, we do believe construction could begin as early as 2022, and as I mentioned, would, would extend two seasons. And 
I think, uh, you know, just to, to close out, um, again, I, I appreciate the opportunity to present this. You know, pieces of the project have come out in various ways over the past few years. It's been envisioned for a long time, and we focused on some other priority projects that were less costly and completed those. And, and now uh, we're really ready to keep moving forward with this project to replace critical infrastructure and, and secure the future of drinking water for the community. And I guess uh, I will close out with that and be happy to entertain any, any questions as best I can. Awesome. Thanks so much, Joe, for that presentation. I we appreciate it. I know um, you gave me a tour of the water utility a couple well, and that was a while back. Um, you, and you really do got a great team and, and crew down there. Um, so I'll kick it off. Does anyone have any initial questions for Joe? I see Bert's got her hand up. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I've got two questions, <coughs> Joe. Uh, you mentioned that the building proper, the one that's right there down on the lakefront now, has, quote, quite a few years of good life left. Quite a few years, 30 years, 40 years, 80 years, 20 years? Um, not 80 years. I would say, you know, there, there are ways to, we have portions of the plant that are newer and portions that are older. So I would say there are some portions that within 20 to 30 years would, would need investment. Uh, I would say in, in the 40 year plus range, a, a large portion of the plant would need uh, significant investment or replacement. Okay, so. thank you. And then the second question, um, if the funding is 30 to 40 years, hopefully 30 to four years to amortization, is it feasible or have you in the past refinanced, uh, kind of like a home loan? Uh, I believe I've refinanced at least three times. So is that in part of the package or once it's set, it's set? Uh, if we go with a state drinking water loan, those are not callable. So those are fixed, you can't do anything with them. If right. we go with the, the private bond market, those are callable. And, and yes, as you say, we've had opportunities in the past to call those in and refinance them and, and save some money. Um, right now, interest rates are very low. So mm -hmm. I, I would say that's an advantage in the private market is the ability to do that, particularly if interest rates are high when you go in. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Alderman Boren. Go for it, Jim. Thank you. Uh, Joel, uh, uh, I haven't been down to your, your facility for quite a few years, but I did take a tour when I first became an alderman. Uh, and knowing the layout along the lakeshore there, have there been any erosion problems in the past, or could there be erosion problems in the future with the erosion along Lake Michigan? Is that any is that any concern at all, or has it been a concern in the past? Yeah, that, that's a great point, and and there is a concern, and there has been erosion, particularly as the water levels have come up. So this past year, we we did some uh, rehabilitation of uh, existing shoreline protection behind the the water treatment plant, and in the new area proposed, uh, there's about a shoreline protection system uh, design that would cost about $2.6 million um, to secure that shoreline. And, and that's the portion of the project that we uh, are in the process of applying for a FEMA uh, brick grant because those grants are intended to mitigate uh, loss due to, to disasters like flooding or wave damage. Um, so yes, we would definitely be constructing shoreline uh, protection in, in that area. Uh, currently, it has very little. There's a, a little bit of riprap rock, but it is uh, it is eroding, that's for sure. 
Uh, also, uh, Joe, if, if any recent projects that you're aware of around the state, uh, what funding sources have been taken advantage, uh, are, are utilities taking advantage of? Are they more or less going with, with callable loan programs or some of the other programs that you, that you referenced? A lot of water utilities have been funding projects with safe drinking water loans. Um, they do have lower interest rates than going into the private market. And I, I think it's a combination of how large is the project, uh, what's the lifetime, you know, and if you can spread that debt over more years, it, it can have uh, less rate impact in the short term. And, and that's definitely a factor on a larger project. Um, so I think, you know, many utilities are funding smaller projects using safe drinking water loans, but larger projects, then there tends to be some advantage in the private bond market. Um, but safe drinking water loans is, are certainly uh, a path that we would consider, especially in the 30 year term. The 25 year term would, would be too short. Thank you. Thank you. I, got a I have a question, Alder Feldy. Yep, go for it, Barb. Thank you. Um, Superintendent, um, we've talked about loans. Um, have you discussed grants at all? Is that possible? Uh, we have discussed the FEMA BRIC grant uh, option for the entire project. But having said that, um, FEMA BRIC does, uh, is focused on certain types of projects and we're not really sure. This is only the first year of the FEMA BRIC program, building resilient infrastructure. We're not exactly sure that the whole project would be a, a great application, um, but we are applying for the shoreline protection, which again is the uh, $2.6 million portion of the project. Uh, based on the outcome of that application, we, we might try to pursue the whole project. Um, otherwise, in the drinking water side of things, there, there aren't a lot of grant programs out there. That, that's why there's a lot of interest in, in BRIC um, and, and why we've, we've jumped on that bandwagon. Uh, there may be a few other smaller grant programs, but I really don't have any knowledge of, of one that would be large enough for the entire project other than the BRIC program. I'd suggest that even if it's not a whole project, um, grants that you go after any amount of money because rather than raising rates, I would rather see us tie into some grants. That's it. Thank you. Thanks, Barb. Any other questions from any other alders? Uh, Mike? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think one of the things everybody needs to understand about the FEMA BRIC program is these are competitive grants across the nation. So while Joe is putting together something for the first round, um, the, I think there's $500 million available uh, in the first round. The next round is supposed to be funded at a, at a billion dollars. So, um, you know, just so you understand why uh, it's not a sure thing. It's it's more than just uh, somebody saying yes or no. It's going to be based on all the other grant requests that come in and, and, and how they dole them out. Thanks, Mike. Any other questions from folks? Ryan, uh, David Eagle on the line. Hey, David, how's it going? Good. Say, Mr. Chairman, I just, if, if I could just, um, I just want to, first of all, uh, I support Joe and all the projects. This is a very important piece of infrastructure um, long-term for our community. So it's a very important pro project. And, and I want to advocate uh, obviously for, for, this, for this project to move forward. I guess, Joe, if you could, I, my question is really surrounding the wholesale customers and how does that factor into the contract or the pay um, moving forward on the debt service of this. And ultimately, I mean, um, 
if, if, if in the future, for instance, these contractor wholesalers, if they demand more water um, and they're using more water, is it then under contract and under this debt service that they pay their fair share or buy into that? Um, not that uh, it could potentially take away or that it's, it really ends up being a burden on the city ratepayers. So I'm, I'm just curious in terms of how their, that wholesale connection uh, cost factors into the cost of this project. Well, this is where the, the concept of uh, public utilities regulated by the Public Service Commission is, is critical. We don't set our own rates. The Common Council doesn't set water rates. The Board of Water doesn't set water rates. The State Public Service Commission determines fair uh, water rates for each public utility. And they also determine fair water rates for wholesale customers based on their uh, usage uh, and all kinds of factors as a, a burden, so to speak, on, on the supplying utility. So the wholesale customers uh, are factored in based on their usage, their, their size, their demands upon the system in, in each category of our expenses. So in no way are they getting a, a, a free ride or a bargain when we incur debt uh, they're pay paying their fair share as determined by the regulator of, of public utilities. Um, you know, one example of that, if you look at the water rates in, in a Sheboygan Falls or the village of Kohler, they're considerably higher than the water rates in the city of Sheboygan. Um, that's because they have to take uh, the charges that they pay for our water and add their own expenses on top of that, and, and they result in much higher water rates in those communities than in the city. So there, there really shouldn't be any concern that somehow our wholesale customers are, are, are not contributing because as rates go up, uh, their rates go up as well uh, each time we go in for a, a rate case. In fact, we'd like to have more wholesale customers because they provide that growth that we need uh, a public utility has a lot of fixed expense. You know, we have fixed infrastructure. If we sell 10% more water, uh, that, that's a great thing to help offset that, that fixed cost basis. So, yeah, I understand the concern that, you know, maybe somehow Kohler or Sheboygan Falls are, are not contributing, but they would certainly be uh, paying their fair share as, as determined by the PSC for their wholesale rates each time we have a, a rate case that's adjusted and and treated accordingly uh, with their rate models. Um, so, based on that, is then they're they're not are they under contract? Uh, we have wholesale water agreements and have had for decades with those communities. Yes. So, so in other words, I mean, if, with this project, they, they're going to agree that they're going to remain wholesale customers for the duration of the, the, the loan instrument? Or, I'm, I'm, I'm just, this hypothetically, if Kohler and Falls decide at some point, you know what, we have our own uh, infrastructure in place, maybe we will uh, go off and do our own water utility and start putting wells in and, and then not get water from the city of Sheboygan. Well, they have their own water utilities. We're, we're the supplier of wholesale water to those communities. Um, we have an ongoing wholesale water agreement. Uh, I, I'm not quite sure what your concern is, that, that somehow we may lose them, or I, I don't quite understand what you're asking. Well, that's exactly it. If, if we supply them the, 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 the water, um, what if they decide that uh, they don't want to receive our water in the future um, and, you know, develop their own water system in terms of own source through wells, for instance. I, I just, for the long term, for the cost of this and the, their, their usage of the water, I'm just, I would be concerned then if that, if they're not contractually obligated, um, there, there could be that risk with Well, my concern is having a safe, reliable supply of water for the whole community. Uh, 
uh, the wholesale customers uh, are receiving water that's very affordable, it's very high quality. Uh, I, I don't know a, a hypothetical that they may try to install groundwater systems is, is possible, but there's all kinds of things that are possible that could happen in the future. Um, Joe, what percentage of the water that you pump currently is is diverted to wholesale supply? Um, yeah, that's a, a good question. Uh, between the two, it's about 25%. Thank you. Good percent. Any other questions from anyone else? So one quick question for I would. Uh, this is Alderman Bourne again, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I would just like to follow up on what Director Beeble was asking, Joel. Uh, how far do those contracts go out with uh, Sheboygan Falls and Kohler? Uh, they're not fixed period contracts. They're ongoing wholesale water agreements. So if they decided that they do not uh, want to receive water, uh, they could make a petition to uh, extract themselves from the agreement. I'm not aware of that ever happening. Um, you know, there, there's all kinds of things that potentially could happen. Now, one thing to keep in mind, uh, regardless of those wholesale customers, uh, we need this infrastructure and although we've right-sized it to what we think is going to be 50-year demand growth, uh, if it's somewhat lower, the, the cost differential to install a somewhat smaller facility is, is not very large. Um, you know, the concern that we're going to risk, that we risk losing a big customer, that's, that's part of what utilities manage and work with routinely, routinely in our planning. You know, we have very large industrial customers in the city of Sheboygan. Uh, we hope to keep them. Uh, however, it's pretty hard to predict the, the exact future. Um, you know, if one of those were to uh, go out of business and, and shutter and not be replaced by other water users, that would certainly impact our financial plans as well. So I, I think, you know, this, this isn't an inter-community problem I think the problem is uh, growth. We want to have good growth to support the finances of the water utility. And, you know, I, I think that's kind of my focus, not so much what might potentially happen uh, with our wholesale customers. Well, uh, the pro the problem uh, the problem as I see it, Joe, if that would happen, if we would lose those two wholesale customers, uh, with this project of this size and with the rates going up, as you say, more to the mid range and from the on the lower end, if we lose lose those whole t wholesale customers, much more of the burden is going to is going to uh, fall on the uh, city of Sheboygan water customers, and that's why. It's a little scary that you know that these whole, these uh, uh, wholesale customers don't have uh, some type of an agreement into the future that they're going to remain customers. Yeah, I understand that point, but in the same way, uh, those customers could have made decisions like that in the past. And you know, again, we're, we're talking about critical infrastructure and whether or not we have those two wholesale customers and we gain some other large customer in, in five, 10, 15 years, you know, that, that doesn't have a huge impact on the size of this project as finance over 30 or, or even 40 years. Yes, there's some impact, but I think uh, to, to kind of plan about a, a, a catastrophe catastrophic loss of those customers uh, would mean, you know, basically trying to either reduce the size of the project or trying to, to force them into a longer term agreement. Um, I mean, I could certainly review with Attorney Adams the agreements we have and 
you know, the ease of withdrawing from those, but, uh, you know, we have no reason to think those communities have any interest in, in suddenly, you know, drilling wells and going down that whole uh, route of trying to provide water by, by a different means. Alder, Alder Donahue? I know this discussion has gone on for a very long time and we really do need to get moving. Um, but um, one of the reasons we annexed the golf course in Wilson is the thought that sooner or later, we're gonna force the entire town of Wilson into our water system. We built pipes for that purpose. Um, and I understand uh, David Beeble's concerns um, and, you know, there's always the law of unintended consequences. I mean, you could certainly, you know, enter, start, begin to enter into uh, more long-term uh, agreements with, um, with these various uh, wholesale producers. Um, that's something to think about. Uh, but then um, will we be looking at needing to bargain for reduced rates? in order to enter into a contract or a contractual relationship. Um, you know, there are all sorts of things to be thinking about. So I think probably one of the ways around this, and maybe David Beeble can even provide this, is what is the possibility for the village of Kohler and Sheboygan Falls, uh, both with growing industrial bases, uh, to secure um, a groundwater um, uh, source of, of water. Um, we know that groundwater, and unfortunately, in the state of Wisconsin, is not very good. Now, it might be good enough for industrial purposes, but uh, you know, I, w I don't want to live in a place with a well. Uh, and uh, so, uh, those are those are all things to look at. Now, on the other hand, the town of Sheboygan did develop its own water source, and um, uh, or did they just? Do they just distribute, Joe? I, it, do we provide the water? I can't remember yeah, they're, they're what you no, said. they have a small groundwater system that they use uh, on their own, and we they would, have very would, low uh, usage of water compared to city. Yeah, what you may want to do, uh, Joe, in, in just try, trying to put a, a ribbon around this is, is to see what the, uh, the PSD can provide in terms of the possibility for groundwater development uh, at fairly high levels and, um, and kind of take it from there. Um, we may want to look at other municipalities that have, you know, gone from a a producer consumer uh, relationship to a contractual relationship to, if that's happened i don't know if it has yeah, to see I, it, I, you know I, how that's worked I remember, out i remember watching and, <laughs> what do you what, oh we're happy to enter into a five-year agreement was one that was well I mean, then what happens after five years i, I, I mean like, i'm just idea. saying you know there's balancing here and um Yep. Uh, and maybe the, the Board of Water Commissioners wants to look into um, the other alternatives that these uh, wholesale consumers might have. So, well, I'd be up long enough. It's quarter after eight. <laughs> it's time to move yeah. on. My I, I would just that. like so to add an my, agenda. My we should not okay. lose sight of the I fact that 75% of what we're looking at is for us oh, in the city, oh. and we have wonderfully yeah. safe good tasting water. So we we need to keep our eye on the longer term instead of the, okay. you know, we've got to be aware of it, but we do get 75% of really good quality water. So um, and might I add extremely cheap water <laughs> compared to what other people are paying. So yeah. 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 Well, I just stated in the beginning, I, 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 this is, this is, um, I support this project. It's very critical. We need it regardless. But it's just something, you know, we, in terms of consideration, in terms of those wholesales under contract. But um, regardless, as Joe has mentioned, this is this is a need um, long term. It's just they're, they're, the the wholesale is somewhat um, kind of a. Without a, without a contractual agreement, it, it's, it's there. So I just wanted to make everyone aware of that. 
This is Alderman. Born, this is Alderman Born, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we have, we have, as we're as we're developing uh, Sheboygan and especially our, our South Point Business Park over here in my 10th district. This water issue is a huge selling point for for the city of Sheboygan for developers to come in and and, and uh, uh, you know do their industrial plants or whatever development we get out of uh, eventually get out there with all of the nightmares down in the Milwaukee area and the Waukesha area and all of the hassles that have been going on down there for Waukesha to get decent water. Uh, this is a huge selling point for Sheboygan for development. And I support the project, but we just have to make sure we dot all our I's and cross all our T's because of this huge expenditure. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thanks everybody. Any further comments or questions? All right, seeing none, to adjourn. there's been a motion to adjourn. Second. Second. In the second, all those in favor of adjourning, please state aye. 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 Anyone opposed, Thank chair vote, Joe. chair votes aye. We're Joe. adjourned at 816. Thank you, everybody.